ask again that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts, Father. Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to speak plainly to us in areas of our life that we need to come to terms with and lay upon the altar of grace and mercy. So, Father, today as we bring this message, Lord Jesus, again, just allow us to hear your voice as you speak to our hearts. We thank you, Father. We love you and praise you, Lord. Just bless this message in your precious name we pray. Amen. So I love this saying. It says this, our faith is made solid when we realize it's nothing but God's grace that keeps us on the road with Christ. I'm going to say it again. Our faith is made solid when we realize it's nothing but by God's grace that keeps us on the road with Christ. Here's the second part of this. Where patience, I know that's a tough word for everybody, where patience is required in order to understand and realize the substance found in grace. You know, my wife just did, I think it was Psalms, what, 33, 31? What's the one? Yeah, 33. And, and in between each part of that is the word selah, which means pause. See, we all, here's what humanity has done. We want to rush through everything. We want to, you know, it used to be we'd go to pull up into McDonald's and inspect our hamburgers and everything right there. Now it's like, pull forward and wait. We'll be out with your order shortly. See, even fast food has said, well, we can't do this. We can't do this. We need to slow down. Now, now I'm not saying stop and drop, you know, blah. I mean, slow down. Ponder the word of God. Slow down so that you have an understanding while being patient and realize the substance found in the grace of God. Plus, slow down and understand the substance found in his word. Because how many go, oh, I've read the Bible, I've read the Bible in this amount of time. Yep, what did you get out of it? Uh, nothing, nothing, because you didn't slow down. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't chew on it. You know, when I have a nice piece of steak, I like to chew on it a little bit because I want all the flavor out of it. And then I swallow it. And, then, and you know, the only way to allow whatever you eat to do what it needs to do in your body is to allow it to digest. See, to digest. And that's where you get the nutrients out of what you eat. Today, how many live in the phrase, will be done? Notice I didn't say on earth that is it in heaven. I said, how many live in the phrase, will be done? Just those, just those words, will be done. See? Not maybe done, not even maybe could be done, or if he wants it done, but will be done. I heard something today that was kind of interesting. And there's a new movie coming out, and it's on, uh, it's on uh, children and sexual slavery and kids being kidnapped and stuff like this. And, and it was kind of interesting because it was from an, a, a guy that used to um, be one of those people that would bring kids and do these things. And he looked at somebody and he said, he said, when God says to move, we move. We don't sit there and second guess it. We move. God said to him, what you're doing is wrong. It's time to stop. And it's time to start rescuing these kids. See? It's, it's, not, it's not maybe, can we, should we, it's will be done. And in will be done, we move. In will be done, we move. <clears throat> How many times has Satan grabbed your ear and said it can't be done? It can't be done. That's a lie. That's a lie. If God's saying it can be done, it means he's provided the provision, he's provided the purpose, and he's decided to, to he, well, actually he's provided the desire, but you 
have listened in the ear gate to Satan, and he said, well, it can't be done. It can't be done. Do you know how many times people told me before I started this church that it couldn't be done? You can't do that. God's, you can't do that. Why can't I? Well, you can't do it. But you're not giving me a reason. God says I can. God says I have to live in will be done. And so I live in will be done. You know, I, I've told a number of people, if you, if you get a ministry, you, you want to, you know, if God somehow speaks to you and he says, I want you to do this. See? Enter into will be done, knowing that if God has given you everything you need, then it needs to happen. See? Will be done. Don't let the enemy speak to you and say, no, it can't be done. Don't let the enemy say, well, no, 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 no. No, God's, no, that's, that's not from God. Yeah, it is. Will be done. See? <clears throat> if this has happened to you and you've entered into disbelief, then it's time for an attitude check. Because I serve a, a higher God than all these stupid gods we invent. I serve a higher God who says, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My will, my will be done. Well, Lord, you know, I don't know how it's going to get done, but I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to walk by faith, and I'm just going to keep going forward. And, and, it, and if it's not from you, you're going to end it. But if it's from you, I know you're going to open every single door that needs to be opened, that needs to be opened. I'm getting to a verse, a bunch of verses in a minute, all right? Is your attitude in and for the promises of God today? You know, I, I said this last week. We keep saying, oh, I believe in God. I have faith in God. I have this in God. I think God will do you know, you notice that word? I think. How about I believe? I believe God is going to move mountains. See, and that's, again, everything we see in the Bible Every story Jesus tells, every time he confronts somebody, every time somebody says, I believe, it happens. I believe. And last week I said, many of us say we believe, but do we really believe? Do we believe he's going to do it? I personally think in the days to come, we better figure out whether we believe or not. Because I'm going to tell you something. The earth's going to shake. Now, he's, he's prophesying of an earthquake. No, he's not. I'm saying God's going to move and the earth's going to shake. And, and we're all going to be going, oh, my gosh. Now, we just saw a number of things happen, you know, in, 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 in the courts and stuff. You know, and, and, and now here, here it is. Here it is. All the conservatives are taking a victory lap. Be careful. Be careful. Some people say, oh, that, what are you, some kind of weird Christian? No, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a word-driven realist. Now, figure that one out. I'm a word-driven realist that knows this and reads it and I, I've seen things happen by this already. No, I'm not a prophet. I will never be a prophet. I don't want to be a prophet. I like being Pastor Mark from the Deeper Well Church. See? But I love reading this. Because I believe the word of God is true. And I believe everything God says or has ordained people to write about in this is true. It's like the 9-11 thing. All of a sudden, every, everybody's like, oh, look, there's unity. For what, about five months? And then everybody turns stupid again. See? And if you look at some of the things that were quoted or written in the, in the, in the, in the um, Twin Towers, written on beams, biblical things, see? 
not putting God first, but putting us first in defiance. In defiance. See? Why are we so defiant against God? Why are we so defiant against Jesus? Why are we so defiant against the Holy Spirit? Because we haven't checked our attitudes. See? Let me ask you this. Do you live in the presence of God in this very moment? Do you live in the presence of God in every moment of your life? In every moment? moment of your life are, are, are you are you understanding that as you sit where you are seated next to you is the Holy Spirit seated next to you is Christ as we sit at the right hand side of God the Father with Jesus co-heirs to the throne of God do you understand that presence you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because, again, you know, a lot of times, you know, the flesh likes to rear its ugly head. And a lot of times we all of a sudden, we, we kind of flush out a little bit. And in flushing out, we, got, we, we lose perspective that we are sitting next to the Savior. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit goes, snap out of it. And we have to check our attitude. See, we have to check our attitude. Now, some people, you know, there's some people say, oh, we can't do that all the time, Pastor Mark. You know, uh, well, we have a sin nature. I, I, again, I'm going to say it again. We are no longer, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, bound by sin. Word of God, sin has no dominion over us. We talked about that Wednesday night. And we have been given freedom. As a matter of fact, I love this word, independence. What's coming up? Independence Day. It's funny how we've taken the word independence and moved it to the 4th of July. See? Independent means somebody fought for our independence. Jesus Christ fought for our independence of sin. Men and women across the land put their lives on the line so that we could be independent, not held captive by. I didn't even know I was going to go in the 4th of July direction for a minute here. But it's not. It's Independence Day. See? <clears throat> Do you live in the presence of God this very moment? Think about this. How many times have we tried to manufacture faith manufacture faith we manufacture everything else let's try to manufacture some faith that way we can take the perspective and the focus off God and focus it here on me see because that's what's going on in the world today we're trying to omit God we're trying to omit Jesus we're trying to omit the Holy Spirit because the only person I want to be accountable to is me bad news there's a God there is his son Jesus Christ and you will sit before one or the other we cannot manufacture faith and many try many be careful not to fall victim to man faith see Test it by the Spirit. Test it by God's Word. Test the Holy Spirit. See what He says. Bring it to the Holy Spirit. See what He says. And you know what? If you're, if you're careful and you're living in that place where you believe, the Holy Spirit will reveal the things of truth to you. When we understand the life of Christ and we understand why and what he did and that all, all of that is based on love, then faith blossoms within the heart. And it blossoms because of an understanding that we were not worthy, that we were not worthy, but made valuable 
through a sacrifice. We were made valuable through a sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only son. That was the sacrifice. We're asked to sacrifice our lives. Now, some of you say, well, Pastor Mark, I don't know if I can do that. You know what that means? Putting yourself second, putting Christ first. Putting yourself second and putting Christ first. See? If we live in the presence of God, not, not just by cheap lip service, but we live as if the Lord is next to us, then those things we hold on to will bring a conviction rather than a condemnation causing us to repent. Let's look at Luke 8 or Luke 19 for a minute. So if you've got a Bible, Luke 19, I'm going to be reading it out of the voice Bible this morning. And there it is right there. I can see that better. So in Luke 19, 1 through 10 of the voice, it says, Jesus enters Jericho and seems only to be passing through. I have never known Jesus just to pass through. He likes to stop for a moment and pause. Living in Jericho is a man named Zacchaeus. And you guys all know the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the head tax collector, and he's very rich. Very rich. He is also very short. So you got a rich short man. He wants to see Jesus as he passes through the center of town. Now you're probably wondering, why would this man want to do that? He's got everything he needs, and he's short. So what does he do? He can't get a glimpse because the crowd blocks his view. So he runs ahead of the crowd and climbs up into a sycamore tree. I'm going to do a study on the sycamore tree because there's a lot of things behind the sycamore tree. So he climbs up the sycamore tree so he can see Jesus when he passes beneath him. So Zacchaeus thinks he's safe. He's in this tree. He's all set. So Jesus comes along. And again, Jesus is never looking down on the ground. He's always looking up. Why? Because he's staring in the eyes of the Father. That's a pretty cool illustration, isn't it? So Jesus comes along and looks up into the tray. And there he sees Zacchaeus. And I love this because Jesus knows who Zacchaeus is. Just like he knows who we are. See, he knows who we are. I think we forget that sometimes. He knows who we are. The Father knows every single hair on your head, even the ones that have fallen out. Jesus knows who Zacchaeus is. And he says to him, hurry down from that tree. Because I need to stay at your house tonight. Now, you know what? We try to get the best view. But Jesus says, I want to come to your house tonight. I want to, I want to abide in your house tonight. I'm not tapping my chest because I like to. I'm not trying to jump stop my heart. This house here. I, w- I want to come and stay at your house tonight. Even though Jesus knows who we are. So Zacchaeus scrambles down and joyfully brings Jesus back to his house. He's like, oh, this will be great. Look, I'm, a, I'm the wealthiest man in the whole place. I'm a little short, but you know what? That's okay. Uh, and the crowd will see this and they'll be happy, but they're not. They're upset crowd is upset. Why? Because Jesus has become the house get of this feller who is a notorious sinner. Remember Paul said, I'm the worst sinner of them all. I'm the worst sinner of them all. But Jesus lives in me. Lord, I'm giving ha- and Zacchaeus All of a sudden, enters into conviction. The Lord never said anything. Jesus never said anything except, I want to come and stay at your house. Lord, I'm giving half of my goods to the poor, and whomever I have cheated, I will pay back four times of what I took. 
It's called conviction. Wow. Oh, oh. Why? Because he's in the presence of Christ. He understands that this is a man that has been called by God and does so many things. So many things. And Zacchaeus didn't even see half the things Jesus had done. He just knew that in the presence of the Savior, something was happening. Something was changing. Something was bringing conviction. And Jesus says, today, liberation has come to this house. Since even Zacchaeus is living as a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to liberate the lost. How many times, how many times do we go, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, yeah, I have faith. And then we turn and do exactly what we did before. No conviction, no thought. Do you believe? He is who he says he is. Do you believe that God's ordained word is power? There's a word I like, because here's what happened here. Zacchaeus had an explosion. There was an explosion in Zacchaeus' heart. And I love this because explosion in the Greek strongs is pure, P-U-R. It's the fire of God which transforms all it touches. Now, you know, you're probably saying, well, Pastor Mark, I don't see where Jesus touched Zacchaeus. You're right. It was his presence that touched Zacchaeus. His presence. We're waiting for the explosion. But the explosion starts here. I love it when people say, oh, there's revival. Where did it start? Oh, oh. Revival starts here. There's an explosion that happens. It's the fire of God which transforms. Zacchaeus was transformed. Nobody took the King James and pounded him over the forehead with it. Nobody got to him and went, Jesus just said, I'm staying at your house tonight. And Zacchaeus went, Wow, this is going to be awesome. But what the crowd do? The crowd got mad. I can't believe he's saying. You know what? You got to believe it. You got to believe it. Because that's the will of God. The Son of Man came to seek and to liberate those that are lost. I love it because, you know, a lot of people used to hold my past against me. Well, God can't use him. God can't use him. And it's funny how, you know, when, when, when the Lord called me to start doing ministry work, the first thing was a youth group. And that youth group went from 10 kids that were kind of just kids in the church to over 70 kids outside of the church. And then he said, I want you to start talking to extreme sport people. Now, you know, people go, extreme sport, you look like a 747 transporter. Yep, that's what I said, too. I said, Lord, you know, I'm not that spelt young man that I used to be. He says, yeah, but you got guts and courage, and that's all I care about. And so then we started snowboarding. And then we started surfing. And every Friday and Saturday night, Hundreds and hundreds of kids would show up down in Old Orchard Beach to the house of David. And we had a blast. Not a blast just having fun, but a blast putting the Lord at the center of all things. And God moved in an amazing way. And people used to say, you're just down there slacking off doing this and that, you know. And I said, why don't you come down and see what we do? I'm not going to go down in Old Orchard Beach. then you will never understand the liberation that comes even in those 
that you see as not worthy. Because God sees everybody as worthy. And he gives them an invitation. See? Again, what happens in that invitation? There's an explosion. We pray for an explosion. It, it, this explosion transforms all it touches. It enlightens and purifies. Now, don't get, he's going new age. No, he hasn't. It enlightens, it, phew, a light bulb goes on, and purifies so that we can share more and more in his likeness. See? What does Zacchaeus say? I'm going to give everything back. I'm going to give four times what I took, and I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. What does the word of God say? To give. To give. To give. Give without re expecting anything in return. See? Are, are we truly liberated today? H have we truly allowed God to liberate us from the idealistic things in the world that we've created and put before him? Think about that question for Again, in this, there is the uninterrupted privilege of being transformed, which can only happen through experiencing faith from him. You can't, you can't make that up yourself. It comes from experiencing. Don't raise your hands. How many of you have prayed for something, believing God was going to do it by faith, and then seeing it done. How many of you have prayed for something, questioning the faith of God in doing it, and it's never happened? It's an interesting statement. Because honestly, if God says, if I bring something for the Lord, before the Lord, and I say, Lord, I believe that, you know, again, your will be done, because that's, that's how I pray, Lord, your will be done. All right, if this is your will, then you provide everything that needs to happen for it. And you need to provide everything in it. And I believe you're going to if it's your will. Now, again, I, if, man's will is totally different from God's will. It's kind of interesting. I ran into somebody the other day, and he goes, how's the church going? I go, fantastic. And he was the one that said that five years ago, we'd be closing the doors and calling it quits. And I went, it wasn't God's will. I said, that was your will. That was your will because you weren't getting your way. See? And, and again, it has to be God's will. See? It has to be by faith. Have you ever taken a step of faith? Now, some people say, well, Pastor Mark, what's the step of faith? It's, it's stepping off something not knowing if the hand of God is going to be there to get your foot. That's a step of faith. And, and how many of you taken a step of faith? It was kind of interesting because when I was asked to, to become the, 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 the youth leader first at my church before I became the youth pastor, somebody said to me, I don't know if you can do this. And I said, I won't know until I take a step of faith. If I fall flat in my face, then God's hand wasn't there but I got a funny feeling he's going to be there for it. Now, I had no experience in, in working with kids at that point in time. And the Lord just said, here you go. And his hand was there. His hand was there. See? And, and honestly, I, I can say this, and this is just my life. Every time I've taken a step of faith, God's hand has been there. Why? Because I trust him. I trust him. I understand the power in his words. I will never leave you or forsake you. Period. End of conversation. If you walk in obedience, I will always be there for you. And he is. He is. So again, it enlightens and purifies so that we can share more and more in his likeness. In this, there is the uninterrupted privilege of being transformed, which can only happen through experience and faith from him. In this, we can and do become true offerings to him. True offerings to him. 
as we obey. As we obey this imparted faith from God by his power. A great illustration is the fire of God burning continuously at the entrance to the tabernacle in the Old Testament. His fire burned. He, he, tabernacle is the fire burning. Is the fire burning. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting because, again, um, the, the, the people that are normally in this church are used to my, my way of preaching. I, I, I love to make you think. God wants you to think. He wants you to think about everything that he's given me to say to you. And he wants you to think because the Holy Spirit is sitting there going, hey. Hey. So if you're a visitor and you've never been here before, this is the ride at the Deeper Well Church. God wants you to think. He wants you to come to terms with something in your life. It's, it's kind of funny. I had somebody that came here and, and comes here can, on a regular basis go, I have never been in a church that makes me look and question myself more than this one. And I said, that's the Lord. The Lord wants you to look, analyze, do, do a self-assessment. I'm sorry, I have allergies. And with the smoke blowing across the Canadian border, I wish it would not come, but it is. My nose keeps running. A God burning continuously at the entrance to the tabernacle. In quickening, in quickening, has the word exploded in your midst? Has the word exploded in your midst? If it has, then just through naturalization as Zacchaeus, then every action develops and illustrates who God is in us as we lay down our lives. Zacchaeus began to... It, boom! Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, Lord, I'm going to do this. See? And Jesus knew, even though, you know, we love to cast judgment. I love it when people cast judgment on me. You know why? Because I know they're not thinking with Christ. They're thinking in emotions, they're thinking in feelings, they're thinking in senses. And in those three things, you are not standing with God. You are standing in yourself. And so I love it when people judge me. Because you know what it means? I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. I'm creating something through the word of God that makes them question whether or not they are living in Christ. See? And isn't that what the word of... I mean, you sit down and you look at where Jesus talked to Nicodemus. And he made Nicodemus think. And Jesus made people think. But I love this. Whenever somebody came and said to Jesus, I believe that you're going to do this, you don't have to even be there. Think of the centurion. You don't even need to be there. But I know that you can do this, and I know you're going to do it. And what Jesus says this. By your faith, you are healed. By your faith, he is healed. By your faith, that girl will rise. By your faith, pick up your bed and walk. There's power in, the God, in God's word. Question for you. <laughs> Everybody's going, oh man. Are you in Christ today? I want to look at Ephesians 2 real quick. So you can go there in your word, Bibles. Actually, yeah, five. Actually, I should probably go to four. Because I, I. Oh, thank you. You knew it was going to happen. See, she knew. It, it's, it's, it's so funny because one day I, I came in with a message. I think it was on a Wednesday night. Donna comes up. Donna starts singing a song. And every word in my message was just about in her song. And I went, this is how the Holy Spirit rolls. He rolls with us. He's sitting in the passenger seat. He's, he knows us so well, he knows where we're going to go. But God, with unfathomable richness of his love and mercy, focused 
on us. United us, united us with the anointed one, Jesus Christ, and infused our lifeless bodies or our lifeless souls with life. Even though we were buried under mountains of sin and saved us by his what? By his grace. He raised us up with him and seated us in the heavenly realms with our beloved Jesus, the anointed and liberating king. Jesus. If that doesn't get you excited, if that doesn't bring you more in line with Christ, we better take your pulse. So many times, just God is mentioned. If you, if you hear people talking, all they do is talk about God, 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 God. They don't talk about the Holy Spirit. They don't talk about Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. And believe it or not, he does nothing less than God does. His word quickens my soul and divides the categories of my life, putting them into perspective based on the truth found in his word. And so as I dwell upon what Christ has done, the red letters in the Bible, his words, quicken. Where am I? His word quickens my soul and the divides the categories of my life. We all have categories in our life. And those categories are put into perspective. What comes first? Jesus. What comes first? God. What comes first? Jesus. What comes first? The Holy Spirit. These are the three. The trinity of three comes before everything else. Because if they're not in the proper perspective, then my, fam my marriage, my family, my ministries, nothing lines up unless they're first. They have got to be first. That's the perspective. So, so many people wonder, oh, Pastor Mark, I don't know what's going on. Who's first in your life? And you, you could never believe the answers I get. And a lot of times it's not God. It's not Jesus. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's an idol I've created to prevent me from having faith <laughs> and accountability to God. That's so strange to me. That's so strange. See? His word quickens my soul and divides the categories of my life, putting them into perspective based on the truth found in his word. <clears throat> Nothing in this is wrong. You may not like what it says, but it's truth. You, might, you may not like what it tells you you need to do, but it only tells you what you need to do because it wants the best for you. It wants you to be prepared for what's to come. It's truth. And what does the truth do? Set you free. I have great independence in Christ. I get to choose whether or not I want to follow this. I get to choose whether or not I want to believe it. I get to choose whether or not I trust it. I get to choose whether or not if I want to believe the promises in it. See? It gives me independence to choose life. To choose light. To choose the truth. You know... I hated being captive to sin. I hated it. Is sin still living within me? Yeah, it does, but I don't give it dominance anymore. I still am a sinner. But I would rather go to this than I would to go here. Because this sets the captives free. I'm not done yet. <laughs> We're almost done. 
So in this position, my spirit, my soul, and my body, as well as my mind, operate in the oneness of the finality of God's will. When I have all my categories right, and I'm in the proper perspective, and I've lined things up where they need to be, then again, what happens? My, my spirit, my soul, and my body, as well as my mind, operate in the oneness of the finality of God's will. Pastor Mark, that's impossible. It'll never happen. You keep believing that way. And it won't. But when you believe, you know, I, I'm not sure how many of us read this and go, wow. Let me rephrase that. Put yourself in every story. Where it says, Paul, put your name here. Put yourself in every story and then gain perspective of everything that they did. Why can't you? Why can't you? See? Because, you know, the funny thing is they experienced some failure. And what did they do? They used repentance to what? Get back up on and ride. See? We're them. We're them. Look at Paul. Paul was the worst sinner of them all. You know, look at all the look at all the disciples. What were they? They were fishermen. They were laborers. See? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a rich man. All these people and they went, wait a minute. This is me in there. It can be done. But we have to give up. We have to lose our lives to gain life. See? Now, I'm not talking going out and committing suicide. I'm saying lose your life. Hand it over to Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit, and I love this because people say, well, Pastor Mark, then the Holy Spirit's going to tell me what I need to do. Put your hand out. See, because this is what it is. This is what losing yourself is. Put your hand out and let him lead you. Lead you. See? And in leading, what happens? The Lord's not going to blindfold you and run you into a tree. I loved it because back, back in the day, when my brother was welding and he didn't put his goggles on like he should have, which he didn't listen. He's sitting back there, by the way. And I get a call at 2 in the morning. I need, I need you to take me to the hospital. Why? I'm blind. I go, that's intelligent. Do you know the, the sin, the flesh man in me wanted to run him into every pole we came into? I can't see. Bam. Oh, yeah. Should have worn your goggles, shouldn't you? That's us without the Holy Spirit. That's the only reason I use that as an illustration. That's because I didn't really run him into anything. I should have, though, at 2 o'clock in the morning, wake me up and take him to the hospital because he couldn't use goggles. He was trying to get a stock car ready for a race. That's no excuse either. That's us. That's us. You know, every time I weld, I put goggles on. Because I, I don't want to be blind. I want to be led. Just like Paul was led when he was Saul. He was led to the person, I can't remember the guy's name now. Um, Ananias. He was led to Ananias. And Ananias taught him all the things he needed. And then what did God do? He took his blinders off and said, be led by the Spirit. Now, in this state, I no longer have to wrestle against the things that the world deems necessary for me to be. I don't live in the diagnoses of the world's words of who I am. I no longer have to live in the nature of the flesh or the hereditary things or the environmental issues that want to claim my victories. But I live in the will of God. I no longer live in the transmissions of the world system and its thoughts, but in the image and character of God. 
I am made whole, no longer living in fragmentations. You know what fragmentations are? It's pieces of things. And so I no longer have to live in, live in the fragmentations, which in the Greek strong is klasma, which means a fragment or a broken piece. We've spoken about that in the soul series. I no longer live have to I no longer have to live in the fragmented pieces, the broken pieces of the soul that were caused by trauma. I've chosen not to live in them. Why? Because I've gone, brought them back through repentance and forgiveness, and they have rejoined the core soul. I've chosen to live in the fullness and wholeness that God has called me to live in, always relying on God's forgiveness when I fail and his grace and his mercy when I need to apply it. Dependent and understanding his promises. I'm dependent on the promises of God. Now, the woman at the well, remember her? Not the woman at the well, I'm sorry. The woman with the issue of blood. I spoke about her a little bit on Wednesday. She lived in the fragmentations of the world that told her she could never be healed. She lived in the fragmentations that the doctor said, there's no help. She lived in all the fragmentations of a world system and people. And she knew if she could just, by faith, touch the garment of God. Remember, Zacchaeus never touched Jesus. If she could just touch the garment of Christ, then it would be gone. I want you to understand the power in those words. Just trusting by faith. If she even just raised it, then he would take this away. She left the fragmentations of the world and by faith received the fullness of what the Lord had deemed for her. And that was total healing. Total healing. Oh, Pastor Mark, I wish I had that kind of faith. You can. You can. But see, there are others that will tell you, no, you can't do that. You can't believe that way. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You have to make a choice to be independent of the fragmentations of a, a less than faithful response or you can be responsive to the fullness of the faith and promises of God. This is not fiction. But I'll bet you a lot of you, you read fiction books. This is not fiction. This is the truth. And the truth sets you free. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. We come before you, Lord Jesus, today. Father, I love these messages because as I study them, I, I, I begin to compare my life and go, Lord, am I lacking in my faith? What do I need to do to even walk more faithful in who you are? Because I don't just get these for you guys. These are as much for me as they are for you. But if you've never believed in Jesus Christ, if you've never made a commitment to Christ, then I've got a prayer for you today. And the prayer goes like this, Lord Jesus, forgive me, because that's where the ball starts. You can't hit a home run unless the ball's pitched down the center of the plate. So here comes the center of the plate pitch. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I have lived for myself and in flesh for, and in sin for a very long time. Lord I'm asking you to enter into my heart. Enter in my heart and sweep out the garbage. Save me. Save me from myself and save me from sin. Save me from the captivity of the world. Come into my heart, Jesus. Transform me. That means he begins to change you immediately. Transform me in the way that I should go. Transform me, Jesus. 
and sanctify me. Reveal your plan to me as I reach my hand out and I allow you to lead me in your will. Now, if you said that prayer, and you only have to say it once, God isn't an Indian giver. He's not a horse trader. If you say it once, your name goes in the Lamb's Book of Life. But if that was your prayer today, and you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then I'd just like you to put your hand up real quick and put it back down so I can pray. Lord, we just thank you, love you, and praise you, Father, for your words today, Father. I, I love the fact that, Lord, that you can speak plainly to us. Because as your children, and you are our Father, that's the love that is revealed as you speak. Lord, I remember having a pastor just stare straight at me for many, many years, and I swore that he was just talking to me. But Father, I thank you for those moments of correction, of unconditional love, even though I was just like Zacchaeus, Father. And then, Lord, the explosion came. And that was all it took. Thank you, Father. Maybe you've, maybe you've just you know, been living in a strange place lately. Well, this is a strange place. But maybe you've been living outside of the realm of God. Maybe you've chosen to live in the fragmentations of the world. You know, there's this word that I love. It's forgive me, Father. <clears throat> Lord, I'm sorry. I've lived against you. Father, come in, straighten me out, Lord. This, your word, Father, has, has brought conviction into my life. And Father, I just want to stay <coughs> on your foundational truth. And Lord, I put my hand back out to you. Lead me. Lead me. We thank you, Father, and we love you, Father, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this message. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Everybody stand up for a minute. It's, it's um, communion time. We're just going to do this. and. Uh